Hey, everybody. Uh, so we are now at uh, week six. Last week uh, for my lectures in this video, um, this week we're going to cover abstract expressionism, minimalism, and postmodernism. Do a quick drive-by on that. You have quiz number five. And then um, the uh, exercise for the week, which is going to be the gallery visit. And I'll talk about that in just a, in a few minutes. So let's just jump into this. Uh, abstract expressionism, the statement that is uh, best used for abstract expressionism is making a work of art was as important as the work of art itself. And uh, there's no one better to uh, show us what that looks like than, <coughs> excuse me, uh, than Jackson Pollock. And uh, you can find on page uh, 434 in your textbook uh, at the top, and well, actually, on page 434 is uh, two images done by Jackson Pollock. And this is exactly what that statement's talking about. So, when it says making work of art was as important as the work of art itself, the artists are now allowing us to see their hand. It's more important the process of making it. You actually have this visceral feeling when you look at the art that you can see the artist's motion. If you would go back and look at the Mona Lisa, you can't see one brush stroke in that. The artists were very intentional about making it as realistic as possible and them not being a part of it, where now the artists are right up in the middle of it. As a matter of fact, the image on page 434 in your textbook shows Pollock's process. He would lay canvas on the floor, literally step on the canvas, uh, sling the paint, splatter it, drip it, and uh, he was a, an angry drunk guy that, you know, you could actually see the violence in his strokes as he threw the paint. And uh, matter of fact, originals of Jackson Pollock's often will still have the cigarette ashes as he was up in the middle of his uh, canvases. So uh, this was a time where we're just getting down with World War II. If you remember, the Dada movement was between World War I and World War II, and artists were... Um, commenting on how crazy the world was <clears throat> excuse me now with uh, abstract expressionism artists are they're tired we've uh, gone through this whole two world wars the world's in shambles and we're ready to um, find different ways to express ourselves in the the way that i write is relationship between art and life so we're exploring that and artists are more about showing themselves where before they weren't um Matter of fact, it's something that I uh, notes that I've made is that there was a uh, uh, 60 million people killed just in the Holocaust. Uh, over 50 million uh, people were killed by the war, and 40 million displaced. I mean, the world is just in a in a crazy state. It's in a it's tired and ex exhausted and been exposed to cruelties that we can't even imagine. And so that's where the artists, when you see them pouring themselves out on the canvas, this is what you're seeing. Um, Matter of fact, you look at William de Kooning uh, on page 435. You know, you might look at that and think, okay, when's he going to finish that? Or that's a good warm-up. But, you know, that's that's it. You can see his scribbles and the expressions that he's making. Um, as I go through um, that page, you know, um, actually just uh, uh, Robert Motherwell on page 437 Actually, those big black strokes. It's just you can see the actual brush stroke of the artist, and that's the art. Um, Mark Rothko is, we have him listed as abstract expressionist for the test. Uh, I believe I have him lifted, listed under minimalism. And part of the reason that I have him under minimalism is because of, uh, well, because it's minimal art, but the reason that he uh, is under abstract expressionism is because he uses a technique called color field. And it's what that is, is where the artist, there's no subject matter, there's no object to focus on, um, large scale, uh, the uh, use of symbols and signs as replacement of imagery. And in Rothko's case, he uses the the science of color. So he wants you to stand in front of these large scale paintings and just feel the color that it has effect on you. He wants you to feel his art, not necessarily look at it and analyze it. So that's abstract expressionism. <coughs> Excuse me. The next um, 
Oh, actually, you know, I wanted to the other artists. You do have David Smith on uh, page um, on the previous page. Where did I? No, I just saw David Smith. Yeah, there he is on page four thirty-seven. A sculptor during this time. Uh, you got Paul Klee, Cy Twombly, um, and Wassily Kandinsky, all artists during the um, Abstract Expressionism. And now, uh, like I said, I want to jump to minimalism. Uh, minimalism from 1962 to 1972. These guys, so the pendulum and art periods just swing back and forth, you know, so you'll get these two extremes often. Sometimes you'll catch an art period that will pop up that's the transition, the evolution from the previous. But a lot of times these are extreme, rash, uh, radical new ways of looking at the world and thinking. So, excuse me, the minimalist, uh, the statement is, what you see is what you see. What that means to these artists is like, look, there's nothing here. There's not a cow in a pasture. There's not some deep meaning. I'm not trying to send you some subversive message. I'm not even trying to preach to you or uh, advocate for anything. It's just, it's what it is. And so a lot of artists, and this is where also Rothko comes in, is uh, color fields are also uh, very used, uh, used quite commonly here. So if you look on page uh, 451, uh, Ellsworth Kelly, just these color uh, palettes, these uh, five colors next to each other. That's the art. It's no more complicated than that. Uh, the other statement, and this was used, uh, it was coined uh, by the architect uh, Miles Van Der Rohe, uh, but it's less is more. And this is really kind of, it seems like a paradox on some levels, less is more, how could less be more? But really is what that means is the idea that uh, sometimes if you leave some some thought to the imagination and you don't try to express everything, that we're going to fill in more details and more nuances than you could ever paint or express yourself. Uh, I always use the example of um, the uh, Psycho, the movie Psycho, and uh, the producer, um, how he, he doesn't give you all the details. You see... Uh, uh, one s slice of the knife and you see the silhouette of the woman in the shower and the shower head and then you hear the screams and you hear this rrr, 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 and all you see is blood going down the drain today we turn off the channel and say what is that that's crap uh you know there's give me more but at that time and even today you still see practice of that where if you leave less there but you set up the frame where we can fill in the details ourselves that can be much more horrifying than us trying to show all the details which is where today we uh spend more of our time. Alfred Hitchcock, uh, psycho. Um, Donald Judd on page 450 is an artist that represents this time. Frank Stella, he's still alive, just recently had a show over in Fort Worth. Um, the, the characteristics is that there's, you know, so the artists weren't trying to do anything. They were really just, just putting expression on a canvas and not trying to have you see their hand or or even think about them so no metaphor symbolism um the medium and materials of the work are its reality uh, reality uh, use of primary colors neutral colors uh hard edges simple forms linear rather ra rather than painterly so those are characteristics of uh, minimalism Let's see if i missed anyone on here no, and like I said, I think for the test purpose, I have Rothko listed uh, as minimalist. So he really was during both art periods, but he's probably most associated for our purposes in minimalism. All right, so then the last art period I want to quickly introduce to you is uh, postmodernism. And I have postmodernism listed from 1975 to present. The thing about it, I do this exercise often with classes is that we're probably done with postmodernism. So we don't necessarily know, and it's hard to know other than in retrospect what the art period that we're currently in is. The beauty of it though, is we could define it if we just looked at ourselves. Because if you remember from the very first lecture, I told you that art periods, they reflect society, the culture, our preferences, our biases, the zeitgeist, the thinking of the time. And so if we looked at ourselves, and saw what we thought was entertaining, what we were intrigued by, what we were creating, 
then that would tell us the characteristics of the current art period. And I have a feeling that we are past postmodernism. Now, the statements for uh, postmodernism is less is more and less is a bore. So once again, we talk about that pendulum swinging where the minimalists were less is more. For the example that I just gave you, uh, the postmodernist artists are, yeah, less is a bore. Don't just give me a, a canvas just with a color painted on it. That's boring and not interesting. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, they, the other statement I really like from uh, the postmodernists is we form art, art forms us. So if you think about this, the, the best way to describe it is probably selfies. Like I don't know when it became uh, entertaining to see ourselves. And when that, at some point, that was raised to a higher level of art, uh, real reality television is a great example of this. When did it become interesting or entertaining to watch three or four people sit in a room and talk to each other? Now I'm old. That doesn't seem interesting to me. I don't care if it is Kim Kardashian. It's still not interesting to me. But for some reason, we can't get enough of it. And uh, so people who, with no talent, who are nobody, have become celebrities have become people that we want to watch that entertain us. And this would be an example of uh, we form art, art forms us. Now, another characteristic of um, um, postmodernism is that, uh, or one other thing about it is that instead of looking towards the future for wisdom or the past for wisdom and the future for inspiration, we're trying to stay in the present with uh, postmodernism. Uh, artists that uh, uh, that reflect what postmodernism looks like is uh, um, Christo and Jean Claude. Uh, they actually do some really interesting, weird things, uh, but it's basically installation art. What installation art is is it's art that invites the audience into the art that they actually are part of it. Uh, a friend of mine, Tom Riccio is a uh, is a theater director and writer in the area in Dallas and um, he creates plays we actually invites the audience to walk onto the stage and be a part of the play that's performance art but it's also installation art and so before where we sat back and we observed and that was our only role as an audience now directors such as Tom will invite the audience to actually come in and interact with the actors as they're doing the play um, Christo and Jean-Claude, I always like to show their work where they uh, wrap this castle in Germany. Just simply um, sheets and sheets, millions of square yards of sheets of uh, fabric that they just put over this castle. It took them 25 years to um, put together, raise the money to do, to create, and then uh, it was up for 10 days and they took it down. That's installation art. Uh, and just the aside, you might say, well, what's the point? Why would they do that? Uh, thousands of people came out and viewed this. So one, you always want to try to understand what the artist's intention is and whether they were able to accomplish what they were intending to do. Uh, Christo's goal is the process of creating art. So that it took 25 years makes him very excited because it was a long process and that was the art. The fact that thousands of people came out and looked at what doesn't matter what they were saying, they were out there where before they wouldn't have been. And that's the effect of the art. And whether it's good or bad or you buy it or you want it, that's another question. It has nothing to do with whether the artist was successful in accomplishing their, their task. Well, uh, on page uh, 453, uh, you have a, a Christo piece where it's a, it's a long fence that he placed across the countryside. You can read about that and see that. There's also this uh, gentleman, Walter DiMario. Um, he created a lightning field. And um, really the way that you experience this is by photographs. Because one, you don't want to be standing out there. But it's what he did is he put these tall metal poles out in this field where they have a lot of brilliant, strong uh, lightning storms throughout the year. And uh, so these metal poles attract the lightning. And so they're all come to this one area and creates these beautiful images but to him the poles in the field are as much the art as the lightning coming down um another one that uh this uh, young lady on page 455 she is uh really explores dots and she makes herself part of the process and then she creates these environments where people walk into them even where the city where she had an exhibition 
she covered all the trees, covered everything in dots, so people actually were emerged in the art, and that's that's her work. Um, <coughs> excuse me. There is um, I have a page. I think uh, Banksy is one of the art. Not I think, but Banksy is one of the artists I like to talk about. Uh, you can see one of his pieces of work on um, yeah on page four seventy eight. Uh, Banksy is a graffiti artist. Before we, we wouldn't have thought as graffiti artists as fine artists, but Banksy has taken this to another level. His uh, work is very thought provoking. And then the choice of his medium of being graffiti adds another uh, aspect to it where everything he does is illegal and it's subversive. Um, and uh, matter of fact, he go he's, anonymous and he uh, we don't know who he is because what he's doing is illegal he'd be fine for the work that he's doing um but you might want to check him out he's b-a-n-k-s-y banksy he's on page 478 um frank gary is an architect during this time he's a contemporary architect um i, I always like introducing frank gary as an artist that re reflects his time because where it says we form art, art forms us. Once again, that puts the artist right in the middle of the work. Uh, I think I have her Sherry. Uh, no, it's not Sherry Levine. There's an artist that she's a photographer. She only takes pictures of herself. So taking that self uh, selfie to another level. She stages all her photographs. Uh, matter of fact, there's an example of a gentleman on uh, page uh, 477 that does the same thing as the lady that I'm referencing. Um, <clears throat> But Frank Gehry, is what he does is he thinks of his buildings as art. So in essence, where we're talking about in a Renaissance, the Mona Lisa, the artist didn't want you to think about them. They wanted to create this as realistic as possible image painting. Uh, now the artists are comfortable with you thinking about them and seeing them and then putting themselves right in the middle of the art. Or as the abstract expressionist, you could see their process in making the art. And that was okay with them. Um, Gary has it where the buildings are our tomb. So when you walk into the building, you're like, who did this? Oh, this is a Frank Gehry. And you can feel it. And it almost is competing with the living space. And architects are, can be very critical. They're split down the middle, whether this is good or bad. They either hate it or they love it. And your um, thought on this might be, you know, if you're sitting in a room, who designed it? Do you want to know? Do you care? Do you want to think about the person that designed that room? Or do you want it to... Uh, compliment and accommodate your living style and how you want to be in that room so that you don't think about the person that produced it. And that's the difference between uh, Renaissance and postmodernism is that the artist wants you to think about them now while you're in the process of interacting with life, with the world. Um, so that's postmodernism. And like I said, we're probably in a different art period. It'd be interesting to uh, know what it is, but you can't really ever know that because there's so many different art movements that are going on uh, that to distinguish any one right now would be premature. It wouldn't be wise. As a matter of fact, we might even still be in the middle of postmodernism. Maybe it'll be a 50-year movement, uh, but only the scholars and academics and experts in retrospect will really be able to figure that out. So your exercise for this week is a gallery visit. And is what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to uh, visit a gallery or museum and answer the following questions. Now, before I tell you this, let me just uh, direct you to the place. Let's see. On page 390, page 390 in your textbook, you have a picture of uh, the screen. It was created in uh, 1893 by Edvard Munch. And uh, I love showing this image because you look at it, and it literally, I mean, there's a many, uh, there's a couple uh, uh, copies of this. There's, I mean, like multiple series of this. This particular one that's shown is tempera and crayon on cardboard. Tempera and crayon on cardboard. Now I'm repeating that because that's that's worse than what your kids, what your young brother and sister are doing in kindergarten. They're at least using Manila paper. As a matter of fact. 
I think Monk even has one on Manila paper that's like eight and a half by 11. It's just this regular sheet of paper that he's using crayon and colored pencil and temper paint. And he created this. And I say this, and, and this actually is perfect because along with the um, abstract expressions, you can see the hands, you can see the movement and the motion in there. Um, so that painting, that particular one on page 390, on cardboard, temper paint, and crayon, and 2012 sold for $119 million. $119 million. So your question is why? Why would someone pay that much money? Because, I mean, let me tell you, you could stop right now, pause the video, and go create something just as good as that. And if it's going to sell you $119 million, if it's going to sell for that, I would strongly encourage you. I would quit this class. I would stop now. I would get your butt in the other room and create a couple of paintings like that because you'd be rich. But why would someone pay for Edward Monk's but not pay for yours? And it's as we've talked about throughout this course is that Monk was the first, one of the first to explore this type of expression and this type of art and seeing the world this way. And so he was one of the thought leaders during this time and artists of this time. And also can really help your career if you die. So he's no longer alive. He was one of the first. He created this. He's got limited inventory now. You know there's going to be no more screams. And um, and so collectors will pay that kind of money. Now so what I want you to do is I want you to go to a gallery or a museum. And I'd like you to answer these three questions. I'd like you to uh, find a favorite work of art and, and tell me why. Just keep this very short, one or two sentences, just bullet points. Uh, make sure and note the title, the medium, and the artist's name. Uh, the second question, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, your least favorite work and why? And note the uh, title, medium, and artist's name. And then the third question, find one work of art which you believe is worth $119 million and tell me why. So those are your three questions. It's one sheet of paper, make it, it's minimal, just answer the questions. Um, and, and I have, uh, I believe on my sheet, I've listed the preferred galleries that are in this area. A gallery is any curated space. So you can't go to Cafe Brazil and look at the paintings on the wall. Those are beautiful and they're original art, but they're not curated. And that means that they weren't put up there for you to, uh, with the idea of showing you the art and and placing them so that we could that the uh, the artist is best represented in their series and their thought about the history and the background and and uh, all the ideas and and details about the work of art they're just put up there I don't know because people like to look at art while they're eating eggs I, I'm not sure why they put up there maybe they think they're gonna sell them there and that's that's fine um, a uh, retail space in the mall with pictures in it that's not a curated space. Now, if they have a show and they're showing one specific artist and their body of work and displaying it and lighting it to uh, best show the work and, and show you that art and that artist, that could be a curated space and you do that. Not on, Nothing online. you got to actually go into a physical space. And like I said, I have a list. Uh, the Nasher, the Dallas Museum of Art, Arlington Museum of Art, McKinney Avenue Contemporary, all the area museums. we got some wonderful places around. So that's, uh, that's it. You guys, good luck. I'll be anxious to see what you turn in. And we're almost done, so hang in there.